Our speaker tonight is Kate Pierce from Raleigh Parks and Recreation. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so thank you, Doug. I'm really uh, happy to be here tonight. And I was just saying, I think I'm going to learn more from y'all than y'all are going to learn from me tonight. And I hope that's what this is, because I really do um, think that this is a very special piece of property. And there might be some really cool opportunities that we can come up with some ideas to work together over the next two years. We were just brainstorming a few, so maybe we can talk about those shortly. But as Doug mentioned, I'm um, Kate Pierce with the City of Raleigh. I'm the project director for Dix Park. So everything from the porta potties out there to the future planning of what the place is going to become falls under kind of my area of responsibilities. Um, all I do every day, every of uh, every week is work on Dix Park. So all of my colleagues, they do lots of other stuff. They do 10 to 12 parks at a time. I'm completely focused on Dix Park. Um, so that's just a, a little bit about me. I'm, I'm new to Raleigh, but um, happy to be here. So um, we really do believe that this property has the opportunity to become America's next great park. And I don't say that just because it's a nice catchphrase. Um, there aren't <coughs> projects like this in the United States right now. Most parks, most urban parks, are being made from leftover spaces. So they're being made as part of a um, old rail trail. They're being made as part of an old aqueduct. The fact that there's 308 acres right in the heart of our community is really unprecedented, and it's an exciting time to be here. So what for that $52 million, what did the city actually purchase? 307.9 acres, y'all probably recognize this space. We call it the big field. Um, and it also includes 85 structures totaling 1.2 million square feet of building sp space built between 1856 and 1973. So it's a lot of old buildings. He was out painting one last week, so thanks for that. Um, so a lot of land, but also a lot of building to um, deal with. We do have four main tenants on the property currently. So the area in orange is the land that we, the land and the buildings we lease to the Department of Health and Human Services. So they have their um, administrative headquarters still on the property, and they have about eight years left on their lease. DHHS is actively looking for their new home where they're going to move the Dix Park employee population to a new site. It's about 2,000 employees that currently work there every day. In addition to healing, or in addition to DHHS. We have the old Raleigh landfill. Um, we lease to what's now NCFC, North Carolina Football Club, formerly known as Capital Area Soccer League. And so they lease the soccer fields. Healing Transitions, which is a men's addiction alcohol recovery inpatient facility, leases about 10 acres from us in the blue. And then there's a two acre lease, the old daycare, or not old daycare, the daycare that we lease to NC State, and then they lease it to a for profit daycare provider. So those are kind of all the tenants on the property right now. Um, in addition, y'all are all probably very familiar about where we are in the world, but here's the state farmer's market. All of this land, which used to be Dick's Hospital land, um, belongs to NC State University and was granted to them. Um, we've got Carolee Fuller Heights neighborhood, Boylan Heights, Central Prison, Governor Moorhead School, and then Pullen Parks just off the map. So we're, it's also 0.7 miles from this to the Raleigh Convention Center. So really close to everything, even though it feels a world away sometimes. Um, in this effort, a lot of the people that worked for 13 years to, to have the city purchase the property now have formed a conservancy. And conservancies aren't new nationally, um, but they're new for Raleigh. So this is a group of private individuals, community leaders, business leaders, who have come together to basically support funding both capital projects and operations of the future park. Um, a, park, a project of this scale and size can't be done with public money alone, so we're really excited that there's a philanthropic group involved with this. Um, for me, and I think this is probably where I'll learn a lot from y'all, one of the most interesting things about this property is its history and its legacy. For 150 years, it operated as a plantation, and we obviously know there was a pre-plantation history there, but there's no written record of that. For 150 years, it operated as the state's first mental health hospital. And for the next 150 years, we really do believe it has the potential to become America's next great park. Um, so the Spring Hill House, the Spring Hill Plantation, a man by the name of Theophilus Hunter Sr. moved his family from Johnston County to this location in, um, before actually Wake, Camp, Wake County was formed. 
in the early 1700s. Um, this was a t mostly a timbering uh, plantation, so it wasn't a lot of crops. They had a sawmill, um, and so the majority of their money, the Hunter family's money, actually came from timbering operations of um, their plantation and area tree owners. Um, Theophilus Hunter Sr. is actually buried <coughs> on site. His grave site is located back behind the house, and it's supposedly the oldest marked grave in Wake County, 1789. This house is on the National Register of Historic Places, um, and you can see that the original plantation home used to be a two-room structure located in the back of that. That burned, and Theophilus Hunter Jr. actually built the structure that you see here today. Uh, Theophilus Hunter Sr. was Wake County's first tax assessor. He was in the colonial militia. He oversaw the construction of the original Capitol building. Um, he was a surveyor, it's probably because there weren't a lot of folks around back then, but he wore many different hats. The really interesting thing, which I, perhaps y'all have come across some information about, is we know where obviously the Hunter family lived, but there were enslaved people living on this plantation. We have a general sense of where they lived, um, where the council building is currently, the big building directly to the right if you're facing the house. But we um, would love to be able to identify where the enslaved population lives. There's also written record that there are there is a slave cemetery on this part, portion of the property and that more of Theophilus Center's family is actually buried on this property. Um, it's currently on NC State's campus, so this is, um, I'll, I'll show you the map again, but basically everything on the house side of the road is now part of NC State property, and they currently use it as the Japan Center. Um, so that's something I'll, I'll mention a little bit more about our relationship with NC State. Um, Dorothea Lynn Dix, born 1802 in Maine. Um, she was born to a very wealthy family. Um, she basically trained as a, uh, as a teacher and was volunteering at a Cambridge women's prison and realized that a lot of the women that were incarcerated weren't necessarily criminals, they had mental health issues. And so this really kind of um, got her charged up to help those with mental health illness and to build facilities specifically to treat people with mental health and get them out of incarcerated situations. She came to North Carolina first in 1848 and what she would do is she would go around and survey all of the conditions of people living in poorhouses and jails. She would document the conditions of people living there and then submit those reports to state legislatures. Um, she did this first in North Carolina in 1850 and the state legislature at the time was like, thank you ma'am from the north, we're doing fine down here in North Carolina, we appreciate your work. But then she befriended the wife of a state senator named Louisa Dobbins and actually nursed Miss Dobbins to the end of her life. On her deathbed, Ms. Dobbins implored her husband, James Dobbins, to be Dorothea Dix's advocate at the General Assembly. He did that, and then the state allocated the money to purchase the original track for the establishment of the insane asylum at Raleigh in, eight, in, the, in 1852. The hospital opened in 1856. Just to put that in perspective, it took eight years from when Dorothea Dix first came here to get the hospital land purchased and established. It took the city of Raleigh over 13 years to acquire the property from the state of North Carolina in modern times. What's interesting about Dorothea Dix is she was superintendent of nurses for the Union Army during the Civil War. She's personally responsible for the establishment of 32 different mental health hospitals in the United States, um, ranging from Louisiana all the way to Maine. Um, the other interesting thing from a design perspective is Frank Lloyd Wright, who was kind of the father of landscape architecture, he's the one that designed Central Park, was commissioner, the sanitary commissioner under Lincoln during the Civil War. Dorothea Dix was the superintendent of nurses appointed by Lincoln, and so we think that they must have known each other, and a lot of Frank Lloyd Wright's writings and Dorothea Dix's writings mirror each other about locating things, the beauty of spaces, the healing power of nature, and so I think that they must have been, you know, sitting around having coffee, talking about the power of nature to heal people. Um, that's my creative narrative of their relationship. But the, the hospital opens in 1856, admits its first patient. Actually, um, the state archives have all of the patient ledgers. The first man who was admitted was admitted for mania due to sun exposure and people were admitted for everything. They were admitted for religious excitement, for war excitement, 
for hysteria. Lots of women were admitted by their husbands for hysteria. Um, so the patient records, you can see every patient from 1856 to 1917, and then there's the embargo on anything that's less than 100 years um, old. So um, Dorothea Dix, this is a picture of Union Army, uh, Union Army nurses during the Civil War. So I mentioned she was, all, she was superintendent of the Union Army nurses. Um, this is a great map that shows the rebel lines um, around Raleigh in 1865. So y'all are all probably more familiar with the story than I am, but here is the Dix Hospital site, the airplane in the bottom light. One of the interesting things is um, Ernie Dollar, who is our city historian in the city museum, is trying to find this wall. Um, and so maybe y'all have an idea of how we potentially might can locate some remnants of the wall that encircled Raleigh during the Civil War. The interesting history here, April 13, 1865, there's record of 16,000 16, Union troops encamped at Dix. Sherman actually stayed in the Spring Hill House. Um, April 14, 1865, John Wilkes Booth assassinates Lincoln. April 17, 1865, troops get word that Lincoln's been assassinated and start to march on Raleigh. Then a Union general, there's a lot of different creative stories here, but um, what Ernie told, told me, and he's the one writing kind of the Raleigh history of the Civil War, is that as the troops are walking down the hill towards Raleigh, they're about to cross the Rocky Branch River, and a Union general by the name of John Logan turns his own artillery on his troops and stops the assault of Raleigh. This is after already some Raleigh city leaders had ridden out and talked with General Logan. He's notable because he was the man that first started Dedication Day, which eventually became Memorial Day. So all of this happens in and around Dix Hill, which I, I think is, is really fascinating. Um, there's a rock on the property near the intersection of Hunt Drive and Western Boulevard that has some inscriptions on it. A twin rock is located on the Central Prison campus, and if you go down there um, and look at it, you can see that it was inscribed by a Corps member from Eastern Tennessee, and they actually know what regiment he was. They will also get on the loudspeaker and yell at you to get off the Central Prison property if you stay down there too long, um, but uh, we were able to sneak down there at one point. So the Civil War history, I think, is fascinating of the property. Um, from about 1890 to 1930, 1935, 1940, the Dix campus explodes. Um, lots more patients. Uh, they build a lot more buildings during this period. And here you can kind of see the evolution from the original 1865 structure built by A.J. Davis to the early 1900s, all of the different ancillary buildings that they built. A.J. Davis is significant. He was kind of the go-to architect of the day. And if you read through a lot of his papers, he was personally invited down by Governor Moorhead to design and build the Dix Hospital. Um, but it looks a whole lot different now than it did then. It used to be a really beautiful Italian revival building, and it's been altered eight different times, so it's lost a lot of that original character. So the hospital grows over time, continues to admit patients. There was a nursing school there. It first started as a men's nursing college in 1902, but by 1906 they realized men couldn't make enough money to support their families, so they transitioned to a female nursing college, which operated for a number of years. Um, and we just actually moved the archive from Dix Hospital on Monday and found a lot of the old pictures of the nurses that were working there, so that's, that's pretty interesting as well. Um, the Dix Hospital property, so the original plantation property with all of Hunter's um, holdings was about 5,000 acres. The Dix Hospital property grew to be about 2,200 acres and included a, lots of farmland that included Lake Raleigh and extended all the way down to um, points, basically, oh, I'm going to forget, it goes Lake Wheeler on 40 and when's, what's the next exit down? Um, Gorman. Gorman, yeah. So the, hot, the Dix Hospital property spread all the way to Gorman. Um, they did everything they needed. It was a self-sufficient town. They raised cattle, they had hog farms, they had chicken farms. The dairy barn is still there, you can see that. Remnants of the chicken coops are still there. Um, and the majority of that acreage was given over to NC State for the establishment of Centennial Campus in the 80s and 90s. So all of Centennial, including Lake Raleigh, is on former Dix Hospital farming land. In addition, all of the state farmer's market is on former Dix Hospital property and that was also given to the Department of Agriculture for the relocation of that facility. What that leaves us with is about the 308 acres we have. I mentioned there are about 2,000 employees that go to work there every day. 
in the early 2000s, the state did a feasibility study, and basically, you know, this was a the Dix Hospital grew to be able to host around 3,000 to 4,000 patients. With the advent of modern medicine and psychotropic or er, psychotic drugs, um, the patient population continued to dwindle over time. Then there was a Supreme Court decision that said, basically said you have to keep people in the least restrictive situations as possible. So institutions like Dorothea Dix um, were becoming obsolete. <clears throat> the campus is also extremely expensive to maintain. The state spends anywhere between eight and twelve million dollars annually to maintain that property. So the state decided to close the Dix Hospital and build a new facility. And they were either going to build it in Butner, Chatham County, or on the Dix Hospital, um, or on the current Dix Hospital site. Um, I'm sure after lots of politicking, they decided to go to Butner, where they built about a 400 bed facility and transferred the last patient from Dorothea Dix to Butner in 2012. Um, so all you have today is the administrative uses. There are no active patient uses on the Dix Hospital property anymore. <coughs> Um, I'm going to go through this next uh, set of slides, but what I want us to come back to is a lot of ideas that Doug and I have talked about that we were just discussing earlier is how potentially can we get groups that have historically been out there using it for recreation, even if, though it might not be traditional recreation, how can we potentially work together um, to let people of, with whatever type of recreation that you like to enjoy, enjoy the property, because we're not we know that the city established the policy about no excavating and digging, and I, I'm honest when I say that I would love to be able to find some ways that we could work together to do some demonstration sites or potentially to help locate some of these old um, remnants of the hospital that we're trying to find um, and think about some creative ways to get you out there to do the things that you love that would also benefit kind of our knowledge of the property itself. Um, so we can come back to that. But where are we today? We are about to, we just started actually, a 20-month planning process to determine the future of Dix Park. Um, turning this place in from a hospital campus to a park doesn't seem like a huge stretch because it's such a beautiful site. But if you think about it today, all the roads are taking you to a building. All the parking areas serve buildings. They don't serve the park. So we're going to have to reimagine this place as a park. And I think this is some of the most important work that our community will do together because this is a place that we are going to be building for generations. Um, I probably won't be around to see when it's finished, but um, maybe you'll be around. Maybe some of your children or grandchildren will be around and they'll, they'll know that we all had a hand in creating this place. Um, we did go through a six-month consultant selection process, and here you see some of the members of our selection committee and ended up choosing this man over here, Michael Van Valkenburg from Brooklyn. Um, what's really interesting about the MVVNA team, and one of the reasons we chose them, is that they seem to really get Raleigh, even though they aren't from here, and are very sensitive to how important this place is to the future of Raleigh. Um, he also, after we selected him, he was also called the Olmstead, the Frederick Law Olmstead that the 21st century needs, which I think is a pretty amazing testament. Um, Olmstead being the guy who designed Central Park. Um, here's just a couple of their projects, Brooklyn Bridge Park in New York. They basically took eight piers, eight shipping piers, and turned them into one of New York's most visited parks. <coughs> Maggie Daly Park in <coughs> Chicago is the kid park across the street from Millennium, which was an old parking deck that they turned into one of the most visited spots in Chicago. Um, other interesting thing, this is a bridge crossing six lanes of traffic. Um, so you can imagine we're going to need things like that to cross over Western Boulevard so we don't have kids playing Frogger between Pullen Park and Dix Park in the future. They also did, um, and here's just a, another shot of Maggie Daly, they did the jo George W. Bush Presidential Center and were recently awarded the Obama Center Commission. So we're really excited mm -hmm. about their being on board. The other interesting thing is that they heard there's a whole team of experts. So it's not just landscape design, it's engineering, hydrology, and we have a landscape historian um, out of LSU who specializes in historic campuses. And so, for instance, the site in Mississippi, she's done a lot of work on that site. The site in South Carolina and Columbia, she's done a lot of work on that site. So we're, real, we're very excited about the expertise she brings 
to helping tell the full history of a site like the Dix campus. And basically, next 20 months, we're designing a roadmap for the future of Dix Park. What will Dix Park be? What buildings will stay? What buildings will may maybe be renovated or reused? Um, what about putting water back on the campus? The Rocky Branch Creek used to meander throughout the campus and then it was channelized. And we all know everyone loves water when they go to a park. How are we going to connect to Pullen Park? How are we going to get people safely from Boylan Heights to Dix, from Carolee and Fuller Heights to Dix? All of these things we'll, we'll talk about in our master plan. Oh, and sorry, I should have slipped, switched. But all of these questions are the ones that we will answer during the master plan project. Um, and so, you know, everything from operations and man maintenance to are there any private uses on the park? Will we have a restaurant? Will we have office space or nonprofit space for people to use? Um, so just a lot of inquiry over the next uh, 20 months. We do have a number of different committees from the executive committee, which the mayor chairs, to a group of 45, which is the advisory committee. And we have these series of work groups, which I invite all of you to participate in. They're organized around six different themes. Let me see. Yep. And these are the different themes. The park and the region. So what is the importance of Dick's Park to this region culturally, to this region historically? The park and transportation. Um, I think that one's pretty self-explanatory, but how do we get people to the park and then move them around in the park? The park and the site. This not only means the natural resources of the site, but the historic resources of the site. Buildings, partners, those would be like NC State, and then program. Program is like what are the current, the future activities that will happen at the park. So all of these, we welcome you if you're interested and want to be involved in the planning process in a formal way. I'm happy to give you my contact information and you can join one of these work groups. They'll actually start meeting the second week of September and meet throughout the 20-month planning process. Um, in addition, we're going to have a whole host of public meetings. I'll continue to do presentations like this, so maybe when we have some concepts, I can come back here in the spring of 2018 and share some of those ideas with you. We're going on community road shows. We're going to be at every major festival that Raleigh has in September, which is a festival every weekend, because it seems Raleigh only does festivals in September. Um, lots of the, the website will launch later this week. Uh, and then we're going to do some education forums. So an interesting thing is bringing in some folks um, that have done these, this stuff other places to help educate us and educate the community about the potential here. So a whole lot of ways for you to be involved if you're interested. Um, we welcome it. And on top of that, we're going to try to do more fun stuff. So there are these perceptions about this place being a mental health hospital. Um, how many of y'all are from Raleigh or kind of grew up knowing what Dix was? Driving down Western Boulevard, I don't know, um, I had one lady say that her mom used to drive her down Western Boulevard and said if she didn't act right, she was either going over to Central Prison or up Dix Hill. And so there are these perceptions of this place as being a place you don't go, as being a place that's off limits. And we want to open it back up so that people can enjoy it. So we had a movie night out there during March Madness. We showed Space Jam and had over a thousand people watching a movie um, out in Dix Park, which was pretty awesome. Um, and we were having concerts. There's actually a concert on Saturday out at the park, all free and open to the public, courtesy of the Dix Park Conservancy. But I think this is another interesting thing, that if there are groups like yours or your group that wanted to host more groups, that we could do some programming specific to what y'all like to do and invite people to Dix Park and have kind of a, you know, maybe it's a history hunt day or I don't know what that is, but we can come up with some ideas and we'd be really willing to um, <coughs> test, test some things out that would benefit both y'all who love to do this and the park in the future. Um, the really, the intent is for all of us to come to create, together to create something amazing that we can enjoy hopefully in five years, hopefully in ten years, but more importantly that it's a place where memories will be made for generations to come. I, I don't say it lightly that this is a place that will develop over the next 10, 15, 25, 50 years. Parks of this scale, of this magnitude, of this cost don't get built overnight. And so it's something that we will continually work on for the next, um, you know, 50 plus years. But it really is work that we're doing today that sets the tone for generations to come. So that's why I'm personally so excited about the opportunity that we have with Dix Park. And I'd really love to open it back up and talk a little bit more about 
maybe I've missed some history that you want me to know about or things that you've discovered and how y'all would like to be engaged. I know that, um, for lack of a better word, you've been kicked off a lot of spaces in the city of Raleigh, so maybe there's some things that we can do to formalize or, you know, do some recreation, I, I use that term loosely, but have opportunities for your group to do things that benefit our knowledge of the park and that also that you enjoy and there's benefit for you. Um, so with that, I'll stop talking and we can open it, open it up for questions or comments or anything. And this isn't probably interesting to y'all because it's not, but we were cleaning out the artifacts yesterday and moving them to a secure facility. Um, and we came across this little display board that someone did, R.W. Strickland, I don't know if that name rings a bell to anybody, but it just has some uh, Civil War bullets and um, buttons on it. So if you're interested, feel free to look at that. We're always finding things out there, too. So, um, but questions about the park, about its history, things that I should know that I don't know? <laughs> yeah. This is kind of random, but you were talking about the big boulder mm -hmm. on the big property across from the uh, prison, not the yep. one on the prison, but the yep. one on the big park. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know if, if the uh, state or whatever going to knows a lot about it, but I, I went there a little while ago and I was trying to read what was on it. It's actually a female's name on there, hmm. and the year on it is May of 65, which would be 1865. Yep. So right How did you verify that it was a female's name? Um, I took a big piece of paper and I took ah, a pencil okay. and I highlighted the name and it said Elizabeth something. Right. Interesting. And there's just okay. some other stuff around it, but yeah. I can't, you can't really make it out. But, uh, but that's the year of May of 1865. 1865. On there. Yeah. So the the Corps of Engineers, there were two corps there, and one was from Eastern Tennessee and one was from oh, Massachusetts, I believe. Um, part of Sherman's wow. Army. And one of them was an engineering corps that would have had a lot of. Um, tools that you right. chipped stone with. Chisels. Yeah, chisels, the, the technical word, right. Um, and so that's really, maybe that was his beloved, that he was inscribing her name on the rock. Or there could have been a nurse there. Yeah, could have been a nurse. That's interesting that we, um, Ernie's been wanting to do, try to figure out what it said actually, because it's been worn down over a lot of time. Other? The one that's most famous, <coughs> I guess, is the private yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. chisel in yeah. Um, I guess the question, I got two questions. Okay. One, one I want to know about your funding, because it's kind of a regional park, is Wake County taking any money? Not yet, all? but we hope they will. And do you have an annual budget? <laughs> Not yet. So um, basically where we are is all of the programming and events and um, outreach that we do is all being funded privately through the Dix Park Conservancy and the master plan is being paid for by the Dix Park Conservancy. So that's not coming out of city budget. What is coming out of city budget is um, the porta potty rentals, the improvements to the parking area. Um, and so, yeah, so we're operating in our staff salaries. So moving forward as part of the master plan, there will be an entire funding governance structure partly paid for by city, partly paid for by <coughs> private funds, um, and potentially even revenue generation on site. Yeah, so he's chairman emeritus of the Conservancy. Hi. Second question is, um, we, we love history. Yeah. We did relics. Um, oftentimes, you know, we just clean them up, put them on our own display. Right. Okay. What do you see, how can we help you? I mean, it's what we love to do, Yeah. but what what do you want? Well, I think, so um, I just started thinking about this, but it's very relevant that um, there's a lot of unknowns about the history of the property. So there used to be a beautiful glass conservatory on the property that was um, taken down at some point. We've seen pictures of the conservatory. We don't know where the conservatory was located, and there are no official maps from DHHS that locate the conservatory. I'd love to be able to find the location of where that conservatory used to be. Um, also, I know Ernie has a lot of specific questions about that um, wall that encircled Raleigh that he's been trying to figure out. The other is thinking about um, the the enslaved quarters on the Spring Hill property. 
um, is thinking about, if, you know, think about it this way. What we're trying to do is communicate the story of Dix's long history. And we don't have a whole lot of written documentation um, besides reading through wills and land trans or wills basically from Hunter forward. And basically all the wills tell us is the transfer of property and the transfer of human property. So the physical location two to five years away from disturbing any land. Um, but one thing Doug and I were talking about is before any of that happens, so we go through this planning process, we have ideas of what we want to do, and then construction starts. That period between the ideas and the master plan and construction, that might be a great time to bring you all out to do some survey of the area that's going to be disturbed or reconstructed and see what's there. I, I didn't want to minimize the fact there were rubbish pits, but there was, you know, printing plates that maybe yeah. they had a newspaper or a, a newsletter. I found China dolls that probably that would be. the patients that mm -hmm. might be there. all kinds of different things that probably wouldn't have put in the display, but yeah. now it's all asphalt. Right. I think that's definitely something that we would be interested in doing. Mm -hmm. Kate, I'm not going to put anybody mm -hmm. here on the spot, but most of the people in the room, plus a lot who aren't here, have found things over at Dix, mm -hmm. you know, from bullets to buttons to buckles right. and so on. And I think most everyone would be willing to part with at least a thing or several things. Um, you know, it's, it's for the good of the city. And right. that's what, if we had some assurance that it isn't going to end up in a cardboard box in somebody's <laughs> uh, you know, uh, well, bottom drawer. In uh, Florida, is where yeah. I grew up in Simpsons. They did a lot of street renovations in the old historic areas. Mm -hmm. And in the beginning, there was a lot of people, not so much in a club, but just individuals that would go metal detecting. And they weren't like using their head. In other words, the bulldozers would go and they tried to accommodate the person looking for things. But the person would get down and dig a hole and it'd be out of sight from the bulldozer operator. And there was quite a few close calls. Right. So they basically cut us off also, everybody, even though yeah. it's like one person. Yeah. But then they realized that without the people looking for items and documentation as to where the item was found, like First Street, Second Street, Third, you know, right. and what was found, and if it was a unique item, but yet more than one item, the museum, you know, somebody would get together, build a box, or just donate. But we found that when donations were made, they disappeared. Mm -hmm. Nobody knew where they went. Right. So people started making their own box, mm -hmm. putting their name on it, and they didn't, like, per se, give it to the museum. They owned it, but it was on loan to the museum, yeah. possibly mm -hmm. forever. Right. And so what I was going to suggest, if you haven't already thought about it, but after you two started talking, it sounded like you were. Like after hours, like when the construction activity has ended, maybe we can have be on a list, mm -hmm. get a permit, do whatever, and, and work the area. And in return, like you were saying, you know, donate an right. item. But the main thing is the documentation, so you have the history, because that's how you can start finding out where the wall, where the planetarium, right. and things work. Yeah, I think we'd be open to a lot of that. Um, what, you know, what we're interested in a lot is the GPS coordinate of that spot, um, and then documentation. So, for instance, this is a, a large example, but um, a family contacted me a couple weeks ago, and they have the old escapee bell. Oh, yes. from the campus. Their grandfather was a maintenance supervisor and when he retired the family they gave him the escapee bell, the bell they would ring if someone walked off campus. And they want to give it back to the city but have recognition for their grandfather in whatever future museum we do and that's something that we're totally interested in doing. So whether it's you know plaque saying so and so found this or it's our city museum does take collections on loan, um, and so I think that would be something that we're, we're really interested yeah, in. Those GPS coordinates are interesting too. It's a little side topic, but back then they used to sit on top of a horse, and so they had a sex, they used the sun and moon, and depending on how tall or accurate the person was right. compared to today's you know, digital, yeah. um, you could be off like 20 years. Yeah. 
that's the problem in a lot of the handwritten will transfer, document transfer. It's like 40 paces from this tree to this river. Rivers have been moved and trees aren't there anymore. So how do we know? We were chasing stuff like that too. Like 17 trees, all the same, one different. Yeah. Location. Right. Well, where I was going, I think when you get to the point that you you have something in mind for display, you know, mm -hmm. hopefully it's not just a series of display cases, but right. something a little a little more forward thinking or mm -hmm. interactive. But I think if you put the word out, not only to people here, but the metal tech and community in general, you will have more things than then you know what to do with the lead. Yeah, so to be honest, I think we're interested in doing a 2018 dis um, exhibit at the City of Raleigh Museum all about the long history of dicks. And so we would probably do a call um, for, for stuff. Sure. Um, and then long term is we want to do something on site, so some sort of permanent exhibition on site. Yes, sir. There were <coughs> members of this club before the uh, uh, agriculture uh, farmers market was made. Mm -hmm. We went in there and did some collecting. And there's a uh, display case. Yes. Mm -hmm. okay, the program, the program. Yeah. It's um it's over in the administrative building of, at the Ag Center. Yeah. One question you were talking about the wall around Raleigh. Mm -hmm. That was not a brick wall or rock wall thing. It was just a dirt. Mass works. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The only location I know of that still exists is on uh, Downtown Boulevard, the one north, mm -hmm. when you go by, I think it's an adult bookstore. Yeah. yeah that's yeah. a good uh, reference point. Yeah. Up on that hill that's yeah. across the little creek, there's still some remnants of it. It's like therapy, right? Mm -hmm. like what? Therapy. Paris Hall Sale Therapy. Yeah, well, yeah. I don't know how to get to our black side across the railroad, but you can do it. Yeah. I'll let, yeah. That's good. Yeah, Ernie. <clears throat> is the one that's been really trying to track or find that wall. So I'll let him know. I thought you went across there and then down below that just a little ways it crossed over was downtown Boulevard now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To be, well, it used to be the uh, pool area mm -hmm. where uh, the road goes out to five. Yeah. Mm -hmm. five minutes. One other thing, the question I have. Mm -hmm. Is any of the original buildings still in existence? I know it's been modified. That is a great question. So we actually had a preservation um, architect, preservation preservation architect, last week in the basements of the building looking for the original foundations. Um, so the hospital built in 1856, burned in 1926, rebuilt, and then added on to eight different times. Um, there are remnants of the hospital, the original 1856 structure. So it was built back from the original site? Mm -hmm. That was built. It, an interesting piece is um, largest building built at that time in North Carolina, 99% sure built all by slave labor. But so one of the things that the design team is doing is they're going to build a model of the hospital campus today and pull off date sections so that we can pull off all the sections and you'll see what's the original 1856 <coughs> section still left. So we can talk to people about what's original, what's been added, what's been changed over time. But yeah, I was, I've been down in that foundation a lot and it's um, got the huge granite slabs um, so you can see a lot of the original foundation. Other questions? So I think kind of the um, near term, would love to think about, you know, in, doing a call for stuff for a future exhibit. But also, if there's um, any kind of, you know, activity or demonstration project that we could do out there, um, we'd be happy to think about some of those things too. Um, and going through as a partner to the city, we could officially sanction it and those those you know make it legit. So we can come up with some ideas and and see what y'all would like to do. Um, just to get folks back out there. The re one of the reasons um, we had a couple of incidents of folks digging and not filling back up their holes. One guy was kind of waist deep. Another guy hit a, or another person, I shouldn't say guy, hit a steam tunnel. Um, so it's one of the reasons that the, the city enacted the policy, which cities are really good doing. They do policies for everything. 
Are there tunnels on that property? Yes. So the old steam facility, so it's the building right next to the railroad tracks. Um, if you cross <coughs> over the railroad track from the big field, there's an a, a Art Deco looking building. It's a steam plant. <coughs> Radiating from that steam plant is a basically a, um, I would say, 800 foot tunnel that tees into two other tunnels. Now there aren't tunnels that connect to Central Prison, as a lot of people think. <laughs> um, patients were not going back and forth under tunnels from Central Prison to Dix, but the steam tunnels are still active. That's, that campus is still all steam heated. And when were they built, do you think? That's a great question. I would have to ask about that. I don't know. You can ask. It's, um, <clears throat> I was in the steam tunnels last Wednesday, and they're hot. Mm. It's a bad time. Really bad time of year to be in a steam tunnel. Bad time of year. Mm -hmm. it was. We had our <clears throat> consultants from New York down there too, and they were not appreciative of that. Other questions? Well, I appreciate y'all having me out here. Um, Doug knows how to get in touch with me. That's my email address. But um, would love for y'all to be involved, however you want to be involved, um, and welcome it. Great. Okay. Thank you. Very Thanks. Much.